Welcome to One Work, Five Questions with Donna Vitek, that is I, and Dr. Mark Holacek. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Thank Holacek. You. Good, af good afternoon. Let me put my chaw of ginger in my mouth. Well, <laughs> chew on I'm some just, ginger. <laughs> I chew on ginger every day. It's, it's a lot healthier, they tell me, than tobacco. So no, um, no tobacco, just ginger. Just ginger. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, first, I'd like to do your credentials. Um, Dr. Holacek is a professor of philosophy and history who taught inst at institutions such as the University of Pittsburgh, University of Michigan, Rutgers University, Camden, Ohio and Ohio University. He's the editor of the Journal of Thomas Jefferson and His Time, and he has written over 23 books, or are you at 23? Uh, 25. 25 books, wow, that's it. Wow, I was gonna In say you need spare, a- spare time these days, I pluck fleas, uh, ticks off my dog, Jefferson. I, I was gonna say, you need a, um, you, you need a hobby. <laughs> that's a hobby. I, that, yeah, that's the joke. Ticks are bad this year, it's a hobby. Okay, um, oh, we have, uh, we're streaming um, live in Twitter spaces as well. And we have a guest in our room, Pastor. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on Twitter. Um, and Dr. Holacek also has, gosh, what, 200 essays on Thomas Jefferson? Yeah, over formal, informal. Many of wow. them are informal. Very good. My preference wow. is, is not to write formal essays these days. Um, yeah, sort of, sort of past that in my intellectual career where you had to pay the price to write all those. So it's just trying to have fun now. Okay, good. Um, the list of books and the locations of his published essays can be found in the video description that will be uploaded to YouTube. Um, as soon as we're done, um, I'll upload this video to YouTube. Um, and okay, so moving forward with our show one work five questions, I'll ask Dr. Holacek, five questions on one work of Thomas Jefferson. And today we are discussing Thomas Jefferson's letter to Thomas Pinckney, um, of the 29th of May, 1797. And uh, we'll be discussing the Embargo Act of 1807, um, along with this letter. And if you notice, it was written 10 years prior to the Embargo Act. So that was one of my questions. <laughs> Okay, so when we left off last week, we pledged to do something on the embargo of Thomas Jefferson's um, second term as president. Dr. Holacek chose a letter, to my astonishment, um, 10 years prior to the enactment of the embargo of 1807. What can a letter 10 years prior to the enactment of his embargo tell us about that embargo? So we're gonna find out today. Um, and I, I, it was very telling from, from the letter. Um, anyway, um, so I am Donna Vitek, and this is One Work, Five Questions. Are you ready for question number one, Dr. Right okay. away. Question number one, who was Thomas Pinckney and why was Thomas Jefferson writing to him? Um, they shared a large number of letters. I think it was like 48 when I looked. And this happened to be the last letter. He was up. Uh, Pinckney was from South Carolina. He was a soldier in the Revolutionary War, born 1750. Died a little after Jefferson. He was a, uh, a uh, the governor of South Carolina at some point. Uh, after that, he became a, an ambassador to, uh, to Britain. And then he was a member of the House of Representatives uh, till 1801 for a four year term. This letter occurs while, as it were, he's between jobs. It's written on May 29, 1797. Wow. And um, yeah, just after he ends his ambassadorship to England and just before he enters into the House of Representatives. So it's a sort of in between jobs letter. And, um, you know, Jefferson writes him and um, talks about. So, uh, among other things, the embargo. Okay. Okay. Is it too late? I see that I I overlooked the I went past our first slide of our movie introducing um, this. Shall I go back and play it? Yeah, did just play that. Yeah, that's kind of fun. Okay. It's about war. Well, about it's it's war. Well, I don't know. So we could uh, we could have a jolly game of charades. Oh yes. And uh, sing along of musical hits like 
Birmingham Bertie and, uh, whoops, Mrs. Miggins, you're setting on my artichokes. Yes, I think bugger all might be rather more fun. <laughs> Permission to ask a question, sir? Permission granted, Baldrick, as long as it isn't the one about where babies come from. <laughs> no, the thing is, the way I see it, these days there's a war on, right? And ages ago there wasn't a war on, right? So... There must have been a moment when they're not being a war on went away, right? And their being a war on came along. So, what I want to know is, how did we get from the one case of affairs to the other case of affairs? Do you mean, how did the war start? <laughs> yeah. The war started because of the vile Hun and his villainous empire building. George, the British Empire at present covers a quarter of the globe, while the German Empire consists of a small sausage factory in Tanganyika. <laughs> I hardly think that we can be entirely absolved from blame on the imperialistic front. Uh, oh, no. No, sir. Absolutely not. Man's a bicycle. <laughs> I heard that it started when a bloke called Archie Duke shot an ostrich because he was hungry. <laughs> I think you mean it started when the Archduke of Austro-Hungary got shot. Ah, no, there was definitely an ostrich involved. <laughs> well, possibly. But the real reason for the whole thing was that it was just too much effort not to have a war. By gum, this is interesting. I always loved history. A battle of Hastings, Henry VIII and his six knives, all that. <laughs> you see, Baldrick, in order to prevent war in Europe, two super blocks developed. Us, the French and the Russians on one side, and the Germans and Austro-Hungary on the other. The idea was to have two vast opposing armies, each acting as the other's deterrent. That way, there could never be a war. But this is a sort of a war, isn't it, sir? Yes, that's right. You see, there was a tiny flaw in the plan. What was that, sir? It was bollocks. <laughs> Ostrich died for nothing. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's the old Black Adder, the fourth in the series of uh, series of episodes. I, I love the, love those to death. Oh, okay. Oh boy, I just noticed. I think I've had my microphone on mute on on Twitter, so we we won't have this recording. Um, okay. Well, I'll go ahead and end that. And okay, so we know Thomas Pinkney. And let's stop share and we'll go to that. Okay, question number two. Um, Thomas Jefferson begins with some comments on political dissension. What does Thomas Jefferson mean by that? Yeah, that starts off early on in the letter. Um, he says, we have found, uh, you have found that you return a high, higher style of political difference you had left before. And he's... Pinkney is a sentiment that Jefferson articulated when he came back from France in um, 1779. He came back to the United States and he noticed that there was a, a large push towards federalism, towards monarchism, towards strong centralized government. And uh, Jefferson is comfortable at this. This is what uh, some um, 10 years after you know um, Jefferson's return, and he's at this point, not quite 10 years, but he's somewhat, Jefferson's now comfortable with this sort of split. And he just says, you know, um, he says, political dissension is doubtless a lesser evil than the lethargy of despotism. Mm -hmm. Remember in one of the other letters we talked to Madison where Jefferson says, talks about quiet servitude, you know, under coercive government, as opposed to the sort of anarchism you get with with a Republican government and, you know, advocacy of liberty. Um, so he said, you know, and he goes on to say that, and I talk about this in one of my books, uh, Jefferson's Political Philosophy and Metaphysics of Utopia, that Jefferson thinks they're literally, physically, two types of people, people who are by nature conservative and philistic, always looking back and thinking that, that everything great happened in the past and let's not change anything, Adams and Hamilton, you know, everything. And Jefferson is forward-looking, right? Uh, right? The Republican sentiment, the Republican nature. So there are two different natures, he thinks, here. And he's cautioning Pinkney not to be too excited. And at times he says, uh, 
both of these are needed for government. There needs to be a sort of a dialist, uh, dialectical, he doesn't use that word, I am, dialectical tension between the two that is actually healthy for government. And we see just how healthy that is today with Democrats and Republicans today, just how healthy that uh, dialectic is. Um, I think if we were alive, it was bad in his day, but in our day, it's really suffocatingly bad. Uh, one side refuses to listen to the other and the other to the one and each for power. Power is the uh, the key thing and no one listening to the Vox Populi, the Vox Populi, the voice of the people. Hmm. Okay. How's that for a I know. Oh, oops. I was almost wow. on the screen. Wow. I, wow. Okay. Question number three. I. I think I have too many things I was trying to juggle over here and, and then I messed up one of them. So, um, okay. Well, question you're, you're doing your link, not LinkedIn. What is the other thing you're doing? Um, Twitter spaces, but I forgot to unmute. Twitter my spaces. Yes. I, I forgot to, I had, muted. so the whole beginning, I just looked over and my microphone was still muted. So I just stopped it and I'm going to delete it. Uh, we'll just have to try again next week. You're dead right now. What happened? No, I we'll don't. work, work on it next time. Okay. Um, question number three. Thomas Jefferson's wording in the letter is that far empowers the spirit which is driving us on here and beyond the water which will view us, but a mouthful the more, offer little hope of peace. Yeah, what, there. Go ahead. Oh, so um, what is what is he trying to say with with those statements? Who knows? I mean, what is he? What is he to offer up? Uh, he says, and that beyond the water, which will uh, view us as but a mouthful of the more. I don't know what the hell that means. I mean, you don't know what that means. But he's talking about the times are without question. We have, uh, we have the uh, aftermath of the French Revolution. France uh -huh. is, uh, is in war with Britain. What a surprise. This is only like the 700th war between the two nations. And the times are turbulent and, and so forth. Uh, and in many respects, he's talking about at the time of the United States uh, unpreparedness for war with either France or Britain. Now, Britain has the largest naval in, uh, power. It's the largest naval power in the world and has its strength. Its strength is its economics. Um, it has a much smaller army than that of France, but France has a good uh, agricultural society, and they have a four times uh, four times the size of an army that Britain does. So France is powerful at uh, on the land and in Britain by sea. So you know there are advantages for each position. So there is all sorts. Of, and you know Jefferson is trying to say here is that look he says. War is not the best engine for us to resort to. So they're being pushed into war by Britain or France to some extent to take sides. And, and that doesn't square with Jefferson. He said, war is not the best engine for us to resort to. Nature has given us uh, us one in our commerce, which if properly managed will be a better instrument for obliging the interested nations of Europe to treat us with justice, i.e. an embargo. Um, we may not have a navy. We may not have a, a, a strong army um, at the time. We're a young country, but we have economic power. We are predominantly an agrarian society, and uh, European nations need our farm goods, right? And so at some point, we can threaten them with uh, economic uh, certain sanctions, as it were, by uh, uh, embargo. Now, so commerce is the best weapon. Um, I can say a little bit more about Thomas Jefferson's economic policy at the time. It entails no ravelment. And ravelment, ravelment is, and there's a word for the day, by the way, entangled confusion of events. Get right down. Jefferson. Ravel. Right. I don't even know what it means, but it means something like that. Ravelment. Um, okay. Ravelment. I, I like that word. I like different words. I even like simple words sometimes, like much. Much is not a complicated word, but I love that. And I like the word large. It's a very large word for five letters. That very reminds me, word. my daughter, when I used to, when she was little, my oldest daughter, I would say, I love you so much. And she would say much. She liked the word much too. Much. 
Yeah. Well, that was in uh, in, in uh, Dickens Scrooge and, uh, when the ghost of Marley comes in. He said uh, Scrooge says something like, uh, "What uh, what do you have to do? What are you doing here?" And he goes, "Much." Much. This says much. I, ever since I've heard that, I love that word because it conveys so much. Anyways, get back <laughs> to the point. Jefferson yeah, wants no ravelment, no confusion or entanglement in European affairs, wants political right. independence. He wants, on the other hand, free exchange of goods with all nations who are willing to freely exchange goods without any strings attached. Now, you might add one and two together and, and say, that's impossible. Yeah, and it really is when you think about it. Um, he has an intense execration of war. He hates war. He wants peace as an alternative. Hence, embargo, if we're pushed in a direction, we can use an embargo. Um, he thinks that the United States farm goods are much needed because we have so much arable land. They're much needed in Europe. Uh, so that makes us, if we're not uh, militarily strong, uh, we at least have some degree of economic strength. Uh -huh. and, and add to that this notion of a push for neutrality in times of war. If there's war, we don't want to get involved. Uh -huh. Right? That's the Monroe Doctrine. Remember? And, yeah. And he, yeah, I, when I read the letter, um, he, he, he was picking the best of two evils because he, yeah, um, with, with, with this. And, but his, um, in the annals of Congress, the letter he sent in sounded a lot. It, I almost thought it wasn't Thomas Jefferson that wrote, sent that letter in because it sounded a lot more firm than he usually sounds in his letters. His letters are usually reasonable, well thought, and this was very direct. And the, the presidency does that. I'm writing a book on Jefferson and Native Americans, and you see a different Jefferson because mm -hmm. all these remember Jefferson, the philosopher. You yeah. have all these lofty ideals about peace and neutrality and no ravelment, uh, political independency. That really looks good on a sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. Once you're president, he even learned as governor. Once you're president, for example, or governor, that doesn't work as neatly, you know, as you want it to work. Right. Right. Okay. Are you ready for question number four? I think I'm it's time ready. for me to share the screen for our key events in 1807. Um, question number four, let's fast forward to the Embargo Act um, of December 22nd, 1807. What was the Embargo Act and have Thomas Jefferson's sentiments from 10 years ago changed from 1797 well, to now? Yeah, let's see the, um, one thing to say, you have your key events and so let's look at that. I, and I bring this up because there was a lot of stuff going on at the time. People don't understand. Uh, there was the Burr conspiracy, right? It, where people are thinking Aaron Burr might want to overthrow the government or start a war with Mexico, something, you know, something going on. So we have all this stuff going on with Aaron Burr. And Jefferson only slowly comes to see that this might be something quite serious. Um, there is the congressional approval on March 2 uh, of the act uh, prohibiting the importation of slaves into the nation. And of course, as people say, Jefferson never did anything. He could have neg negated that. He did not. He's very much pro-emancipation. And then there are these key events. Now, the um, British ship, the Leopard, fires mm -hmm. on the Chesapeake. You know, the, the captain wants to come aboard and look for British sailors because of impressment. Impressment meant... Uh, uh, a lot of British people were impressed, forced into service as sailors, because you have a big Navy. You need people to sail the boats for this large Navy. And a lot of British sailors didn't want to. So they went to various ports to stop to, you know, a lot of the British sailors would jump up aboard and get off the boat and not come back. So through impressment, uh, the British oftentimes were looking for these missing sailors. Okay. And at other times, unscrupulous captains would just pick up anybody they could within reason from American or French or other boats to impress into the British service. Okay. So you have this key event of the 22nd, the Leopard fires on the Chesapeake. Um, it was um, it June 22nd, you said, right? 
There were three killed uh, and several, I think, what, 18 or so wounded. And uh, this cries out for some sort of immediacy of action um, by Thomas Jefferson as president. And he has to do something. Right. Right? This is a strict, so the first act that he does is he bans all British ships from American ports. And he demands a formal apology. And the, the British are not so <laughs> sorry about this. They're, I mean, in mm -hmm. one reason, because um, they uh, not so worried about what, you know, what is America going to do? What are you going to do? Hit me or hurt me? <laughs> Just like a, a, a big bully doing something to a little boy. And then, you know, the boy goes, stop that. You know, and the, right. the bully says, well, what are you going to do? I'm bigger than you are. And um, I make light of it. But in effect, the analogy is, is, uh, is effective and it's workable. So, I mean, there are three options, one of which is obvious, is nothing. Now, obviously you can't do nothing because the United States Congress and the citizenry in general are clamoring for some degree of action. Right. Secondly, you could opt for war. That's not all that easy to do because Jefferson, as we talk about in downsizing and trying to pay off the public debt reduces Wants no navy, if at all possible. He's going to opt for gunboats at some point, you know, just to protect the coast. So it shows that he has no aggressive uh, tendencies with a, a navy. Uh, the army is much reduced, and you have to depend mightily upon a militia. There's a sort of war going on. Um, so we don't have, it's very likely if Jefferson opted for war, uh, it would not have been a successful war. Right. We yeah. do have the War of 1812 later on, but um, under Madison's presidency. So he adopts, he opts for embargo. Now, embargo might have been just a face saving mechanism. And I suspect overall it was for Jefferson. He said, OK, I can't do nothing. Right. Uh, we can't go to war because we're going to lose. We can't do nothing because we're going to appear like we just, you know, are uh, wusses. Mm -hmm. to put it that way, that's a technical term, this is. Uh, so he opts for embargo. The embargo is untried. It's a peaceable solution. It's not bloody. Mm -hmm. And it's safe, right? Yeah. Uh, what he doesn't realize is that embargoes can be, in some sense, as bad on a country as a war. There may not be the casualties that you'll get with a war, but there was such an economic catastrophe. Uh, not all the, you know, the northern coastal nations like the New England states, uh, in some sense, refused to, uh, you know, it was supposed to be a policy uh, right. related to importation of goods. And then it became a policy that we're not going to export goods at all. Right. And the American policy was mightily dependent upon, Jefferson wanted elimination of all taxes if possible. The primary support for the government was on importation, on duties, tariffs, tariffs gleaned from importation of goods from other nations. If you're not importing goods, you're not getting money to run the government. So, you know, this is economically catastrophic. Right. Plus the people who depend upon you know, importation or exportation of goods are living on no money. Right. So Jefferson, at the urging of James Madison, who is the Secretary of State, says, well, you know, we need to wait this out because they really need our farm goods. And you know what? Britain found other ways of getting foodstuffs into the country through its Navy. So oh. the long and short of it is it, the embargo hurt the United States more than hurt England or any other country. I'd like, I think this is a good time to interject. You said James Madison was in support of the embargo then. Yeah. Okay. So, and um, also John Quincy Adams, and as a, um, he betrayed his party, from what I understand, to support Thomas Jefferson in this embargo act as well. So there was support. He, my point being, he had support of, of his colleagues and peers and oh, um, the Congress, you know, supported him too. But the point is when it's not working and then, right. you know, at some point you have to say it's not working. And right. Jefferson actually 
implemented very strong arm measures to get it to work by penalizing, by imprisoning, by having you know the militia or the army come in and arresting people who were in violation. Mm -hmm. So there are all sorts of deviations from this uh, from these acts. And Jefferson was really acting a lot like a federalist, uh, you, you know, in terms of trying to, because he's, he's sort of like, look, if we have 100% compliance, it's going to work. It's not working because we have Americans in their ships selling goods to Canada and doing things that are illegal, illicit. So his view was, you know, if we had 100% compliance, mm -hmm. it would be effective. And the consensus of historians is that even with, you know, 100% or near 100% compliance, it was still crippling the United States more. That's so he like did have, you know, old Quincy, from my estimation, was neither a Federalist or a, a, a valid Republican at the time. But yeah, a lot of people came on board, like you said. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's important to me because it wasn't um, like um, he took this and project and ran with it on without the support exactly. of, his, of the great John, minds that thought like him. John Quinquoc Adams. Look that one up in your dictionary. Quinquoc. Can you repeat that? Quinquoc. How do you Look spell it up. that? We'll talk, we'll, we'll talk later. Okay. Um, okay. Question number five. Um, question number five. Okay. The, the embargo, embargo is uni What? Nothing. I'm just okay. telling you what it meant. That's Oh, the embargo is universally described by historians as a complete failure. Um, why then did Thomas Jefferson opt for it? What was his reasoning? Um, I answered that in the last question. So maybe I should just, you know, go to um, his political leanings. I think by right. this position, more than just you know, I tried to argue that from a practical position, there was nothing else that Jefferson could do. Ah, I'm like, yeah, this I answer this question in my book here. Yeah. And yeah, there was really wasn't much he could do. It was a face saving measure, but it, on the theoretical side of things. So from the practical side of things, it just didn't work. But at least in his mind, from a theoretical point of view, it was a beautiful alternative. It didn't involve casualties. It didn't involve uh, harming people in any direct sense. It's sanguinary means, bloody means. Even though, it, you know, as it turned out, he was crippling the American economy. Right. Uh, an old friend of mine, Forrest McDonald, who wrote a very great early historian in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, who just passed away not long ago, uh, uh, wasn't always favorably disposed to Jefferson, but he had some really nice things to say that I talk about in my new book, The Disease of Liberty, Thomas Jefferson. It's going to get published soon. Thomas okay. Jefferson on uh, progress and uh, liberty and, and human progress, something like that, whatever the title is. Uh, McDonald says that Jefferson's views were beautiful. In fact, they were too beautiful. They were simple, elegant, consistent. But that, in that, there was a problem. He was an advocate of thin government. He was an advocate of state rights. He was an advocate of elimination of public debt, as we talked about, right? Mm -hmm. uh, no taxation. We didn't want a standing army, but a militia. Didn't want a navy, want gunboats. Um, he wanted non-involvement, non-ravelment, to go back to your new word, uh, in in the belligerency of European nations, and he wanted a free exchange of goods without any favoritism. Mm -hmm. Now, you put all things together, he didn't act, right? Uh, McDonald notes, and he notes correctly, that Jefferson himself got involved in some very heavy-handed activities, the Embargo Act being one. Mm -hmm. He's trying to enforce it, right? We need a strong government to make sure that people are not, we need, you know, we need right. <laughs> members of the army or militia a policing force to make sure that the embargo, you know, and that's not like thin government at all. We had the Louisiana Purchase. Um, I mentioned already that the government had been run principally on import duties from from goods from other countries. Mm -hmm. um, how do you, if if you have a government that's heavily dependent upon importation, how mm -hmm. do you not get involved in their political affairs? Right. Yeah. If England is the country, for example, that's predominantly selling goods and bringing goods, and we're we're uh, 
taxing those goods, right? right? How are we not involved favorably with that country, whether we like it or not? Right, right. So there's an element and a large element in some sense of theoretical naivete. Uh You know, we had the, we talked about the Barbary Pirates War. Uh He wants to reduce the debt and he did a great job in spite of everything that's going on, in spite of Louisiana Purchase, the Barbary Pirates War. But Uh events don't, you know, if I want to eliminate completely the, the deficit, uh, don't get involved in the war. Don't get involved in the Louisiana Purchase. Uh-huh. Right, so events don't always work out in reality as they do on paper. And wasn't so, our ship? Our ship was out there fighting the Barbary pirates, right? Or to fight the Barbary pirates. That's why the yes, ship. Yes, we did quite well early on, and, and that. But the point is, it costs money. Yeah, yeah. And that the whole idea is, you know, and Jefferson says we don't want to get involved in other affairs. But we're getting mm-hmm. involved in affairs, the Barbary affairs, because. Mm-hmm. Look, if you want isolationism, don't send your ships across the seas, because right. once you do that, you are entangled. Right. There is ravelment. That's a nice word for ravelment. I like that. That's going to be my new word for today. Entangled confusion. Entangled confusion. Now, McDonald confusion. says, and I'll, I'll read a couple quotes from him. I'm support, Let's. I'm dedicating this to him because he spoke so nicely. He's a very intelligent man. Um, I think it was the University of Alabama history professor. If I'm not mistaken. And he says, uh, there was a fatal flaw of the Cisco. Mm-hmm. That Jefferson's whole system, even though it was very pie in the sky, mm-hmm. he says it had one fatal flaw. It worked fairly well yeah. when Jefferson was president. Mm-hmm. When Jefferson was not president, the same theoretical framework did not work at all. It started to come apart with Madison and Monroe. Uh, because it needed someone like Jefferson. Right. It's like having the perfect person for a perfect policy. Take away that person, it's just not going to work. Now, whether or not that's that's true, but he talks about how the cabinets and subsequent you know, generations came apart. Yeah. And I'll, I'll read one other quote. Um, and this is from my new book. Is I say, history was not unfolding according to... Uh, McDonald in a Jeffersonian, but in a Hamiltonian manner. Mm. There was a failure to see reality for Jefferson. Uh, and so in setting out to deflect the course of history, history ended up devouring them and turning even their memory to its own purposes. It's a very strong indictment against Jefferson for being in some sense naive when it comes to reality. Um, so, I mean, um, yeah, I, I mean, I end with, you know, and I agree with McDonald that it's beautiful as a theoretical perspective, but I add it implies a couple of seconds and you can wrap, but it also implies a favorable view of human beings that might not be true. Uh-huh. It implies that human beings are generally caring, kind, considerate, uh, willing to share and help in the affairs of government, willing to help other people in need. Um, and, you know, all these things, if if that's not, if his philosophical view of human nature is wrong, the system can't work. Um, okay. Um, so next week, we go to query four of um, Thomas Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia to discuss what Dr. Holacek calls Thomas Jefferson's epistemology of the sublime. Can Doesn't you- that sound great? Yes. Can you, you of sublime right on I came up with that a few years ago in one of my books, and uh, I elaborate on that in my note. Do I have my book? Yeah. On uh, Thomas Jefferson in the Fine Arts, right? I have an explication at the uh, or expiscation. I know you like that word too. A fishing out of what he means, what I mean about epistemology of sublime. So we're going to look at Thomas Jefferson talking about the confluence of Potomac and Shenandoah Shenandoah rivers as they meet and create all sorts of disturbance, frightening at Harper's Ferry and the natural bridge. And Jefferson will talk about the aesthetic sense. He believes we have an intellect, a moral sense, and an aesthetic sense. And these are senses as real for Jefferson, just like hearing and seeing, tasting, touching. We'll talk about that next week. Yay! Oh, that sounds good. 
That's all. Yeah, I just posted something on Twitter. I shared a post um, on the natural bridge. And um, so uh, let's let me share the screen so we can let people know how to contact you. Um, if you'd like to contact Dr. Ho Dr. Holacek to have him as a speaker at your school or your organization, um, college, you can reach him at mholacek at hotmail.com. And his Twitter handle is at Dr. Holacek. And, um, and I'll be posting the video as well on Twitter. And my Twitter handle is at Donna Vitek. 1776. <laughs> okay. Um, and you can also reach Dr. Holacek on his Facebook page, Thomas Jefferson, bring him home to Monticello, Citizens for Change. And you notice how quiet Jeffy was all day today? Did once he sat on my desk sort of lounging? Yeah, my dog is uh, killing something out there. I don't know. But uh, well, my daughters are out there. So uh, he's killing one of your daughters. You never know. No, no. <laughs> No, no, he just wants to kill the hundred pound golden retriever who he thinks he's very jealous of. So, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. So That's he sees, he thinks he has to protect my daughters from Baker from the hundred pound golden retriever. Yeah. I, I don't uh, know. You told me that before. I find that, well, it's sort of like my yeah, dog that, uh, doesn't, doesn't realize he's, uh, he's of a, a certain size. <laughs> And, and uh, next time, what we're going to do is we're going to try something different. We're going to do Jefferson on the uh, on the uh, epistemology of sublime, but we're also going to follow that up at the same time, on the same day at least, with okay. what? Oh, yes, that's right. Your books. Tell us a little bit about them. You have. Well, why don't you tell us about what we're going to do next week? Two. We'll, we're going to interview you about your books and why you wrote. Oh, we're going to be looking at this one here. Okay, Thomas Jefferson and a Taste of the Fine Arts. Okay, and so will you give us a, um, not right now, but um, during our interview, will you give us a summary, what we can expect to learn from reading the book? Well, that's entirely up to you because I think what we're going to do with this, it'll be less formal and you will just you know, start off with a question and we're going to go from there. Uh, but much of what we do here is somewhat scripted just so we can have a logic to it. Right. And there'll be a coherence so that we're not divigating. We're not going all over the place. So it's important to have a little bit of script. This will be unscripted, right? Uh, we might even draw from some of the various uh, books in your library back there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We, use, yeah. we can use my books. That's no problem. Might, might ask you to draw from one of those. And, uh, and who knows? Might even have some guest speakers come on. That might be a good time to do the Twitter. Okay. Yeah, we can do it live. We can do both. Next week, I will do it correctly. I just am very um, preoccupied. Well, it's just, we're getting used to this. You're not very computer savvy. I'm not at I all know. computer I'm, savvy. So. I am not a tech person at all. And I just have a lot of other stuff on my mind. So I'm a little distracted right now. But, but the, uh, the last one will be fun. In fact, we can also talk a little bit about uh, the creative aspect of how it is to write a book. How do you write a book? What wow. does that entail? And that's kind of fun because uh, having written over 60 books, it's uh, it's something that's hard to put into words. It's not as logical a process as people might think, even though it's entirely logical, it's not logical in another sense. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Holacek, for joining us. And thank you for sharing your your knowledge. We I certainly appreciate it. It's always a T wonderful- ATFN, ta-ta for now. Is, is okay. Bye, Dr. Holacek. Bye.